Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, Ingenious Thinkers, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. My name is Ken Tenser, curator of Say Hi to the Future, helping leaders think differently in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity, better thinking, better outcomes. With me today is Sarah McVannell, president and founder of Greatness Magnified an organization specialized in recognition. Like this video if you enjoy our show and subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment with who we should interview next. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. Sarah McVannell, welcome to say hi to the future. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thank you for having me. So Sarah, I, I know it's the name of your company, but I'd love to understand so greatness magnified. What, what is greatness? <laughs> oh, I love that question. What a good way to start off. Um, greatness is really uh, all about noticing the extraordinary that happens in our ordinary lives. We really believe that isn't so, it, greatness isn't something that people have to prove. It's not something that some people have and others don't. You don't have to earn it. It is who you are. And um, it's part of our... the brand of greatness magnified uh and it's more than a brand it's a belief and that is frog forever recognize others greatness and we just we really want and we hope that our footprint on the world is that we help people see that greatness is everywhere if we choose to look for it pay attention to it we will see it and our job then is to help when people believe that is to help them magnify that see it in themselves and the other to create scrumptious cultures where people really feel that they belong and are valued. Well, I love that. And it's so aligned with what we do because high is obviously human ingenuity and it's how we react in, in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity. And we, we are saying to people, uh, we say it in our podcasts and online and our, at whatever at our events, um, everybody has the ingenious in them. They just, they just have to find it. They just have to be comfortable with things. And, I think that's so well aligns with greatness. Mm -hmm. And the time is so now that people have to see that they are ingenious, that they are and they are the disruptors. You know, it's not just something that happens in this department over there. It's not the agile team. It's not the it's not the boss's job. It's not the, you know, all those consultants that are happening out there. Every single one of us is something incredibly valuable to bring to the table. And, um, you know, I was just having a wonderful conversation with a client as we were wrapping up a really big uh, leadership project. And, and, and I think the key insight that we hope to impart is that every single one of your leaders wants to be known. And the more you know them and the more you're curious about them, the more they can bring things to the table that you didn't even know you needed, let alone you didn't even know they had to bring to the table. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled about what you're doing in the world because I'm not sure how many people walk around with the belief that they are, you know, that they are, have the philosophy of high within them. Do you, do you find that? Are people walking around like, oh yeah, I'm a genius. Oh yeah. But, or is it like, no, I want to help you see it. You have it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think it's, you know, it, as I say, we, we weren't taught to think um, for today. Our math teachers taught us to start at the top work through it, come up with X equal and Y equal at the bottom. Our chem teachers taught us to start with the test tube, the beaker, the pot, but it's still linear, bottom to top, to, to prove something. When there's a break in the thinking, which is what ingenuity is about, when there's uncertainty, when there's um, incomplete information, no, we, we weren't taught it. So. I think that whether it's ingenious thinking or I'll call it its cousin greatness, I, I don't think we were taught um, how to be who we need to be today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I wrote a book called The Flip Side of Failing. I didn't plan on writing a book about failure. It was supposed to be a book about greatness. So I went and I interviewed on my my. Uh, interns interviewed all these people that we put on a pedestal about what makes them great. 
you know, Everest climbers and Olympians and 3M scholars and, and also quote every day, people who've done amazing things like survive residential schools and, and left in being incarcerated to start charities, you know, people that we see as no doubt also ingenious recreators of, of mm -hmm. life. Like how did you manage to persevere to climb up Everest? And, and ironically, the thing that we found is that um, every, what, the only through line of every single story was that was that what we thought made them so different was what actually made us all the same. And that is mm -hmm. failure. It was the difference is how they saw failure. And, you know, what strikes me about sharing that with you is if we see all of ourselves as in ingenious and it's all the stumbling and the fumbling and the missteps and the, the failures and the obstacles and the setbacks that allows you to have the breakthrough moments that how allows you to have, to think differently, to, to improve something. Mm -hmm. That's, that is the long-term benefit to the organization. That's part of probably your shiny moments in your career. It's what bonds you to your colleagues uh, when we value, of course, ingenious thinkers, is it's what you know creates more ingenuity. Um, and and I, you know, it was uh, it was uh, as you were saying, greatness is the cousin. Um, it's the cousin as long as we see ingenious thinking within all of us, greatness right. within all of us. As soon as we think that we have some who capitalize the market on it and some people's voice matters more and people's hierarchy matters, dictates more who has a voice, that's when we put up barriers to progress that aren't necessary. Nobody needs to be on a pedestal. We all have something so valuable to offer and we literally cannot survive pandemics uh, inflation, <laughs> you know, mental health, loneliness, things that we're dealing with on a personal level without the support and the ingenuity of everybody. Is greatness the individual or the team? Like, what are we recognizing? It's the both and. <laughs> okay. I mean, none of us could be, we wouldn't be alive to this day if we didn't have people to take care of us whatever that was right. whether it was a, a collective different cultures of course of different ways of, of bringing and raising children um so we we are social beings we we cannot survive without each other in fact that's one of the reasons why we have the mental health and the loneliness epidemics that we have is we had a huge chunk of time where people a lot of people were lonely and divided relationships were breaking down teams were not physically together we we're trying to figure out how to do work together in totally different ways where we weren't physically together we lost social networks and connections and so there's this whole period of time where we had the gaps and the lack of that um so so I would say it's you know I definitely I'm going to put a lot of chips down on the together and also each one each of us has this really unique combination of skills and experience and natural abilities so so traits uh, and and assets and ones that we We've lost along the way uh, because perhaps, as you had mentioned earlier, education didn't reinforce it. Maybe it didn't fit with the particular job, career path they went through. Maybe it wasn't valued in their family. So there's all kinds of things that are unknown about ourselves that we need an ingenious environment to support it to come out. So that's where we start to have the bridge, right, is the collective, the group with bump, that bumps up against the individual. We have to have a context that supports being valuing the individual's contributions and also having spaces and places, whether that be a workplace, a community space, a home base, where that that ingenuity can fuel and foster. And then, of course, it's the individual also believing that what they bring to the table, they can unapologetically be who they are. Um, and that's, I have to say, anyone who's listening that is in the hashtag, this is 40 and over club like me, um, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure your age can, but you know, I have to say, I would not go back in time for anything because it's that it's the valuing of those that I see it like a Venn diagram. It's, it's community and the context and the people and it's our, ourselves and the overlap in between there. That's where I think we get this amazing as we, we move through our life and our career. And as I say, we're the middle age sweet spot, that, as I like to call it, mm -hmm. we have so much more to contribute in our career. And we also have accepted ourselves and, and seen 
when we don't let ourselves thrive and shine and when we put up for less than we deserve and also we select contexts and environments and we maybe re even rejected a few jobs things that we trained for a long time to do or or uh you know we've we've detached ourselves from friend groups that weren't feeding us um there's this amazing evolution i think that happens over time when we accept ourselves and we also expect something more from from our context and our environment and then this is the space of unconditional recognition of, of selves yeah. and others. You talk about, and, and you mentioned our environment. I mean, a lot of our environment um, becomes our work environment. Mm -hmm. you, you had a great quote, or it was a piece that you wrote. You said, you can smell truly indigestible organizations from a hundred bases. I mean, yeah. I love that. Um, and I'd like to hear more about it, but I also the indigestible organization it doesn't mean that to me it doesn't mean it has to stay that way i mean and to be fair a lot of the or to, to my understanding a lot of these indigestible organizations come from people my age um and it's not our fault in the sense that we were taught to put one foot in front of the other um keep our head down shut up i mean that's I remember undergrad business school, my last class of prof saying that. And I'm like, yeah, not so much. Not going to work mm -hmm. for me. But that was that was a critical aspect to the lifelong employment of organizations or within one. So tell me about indigestible organizations and how we can switch it and how we can do it in a way that doesn't blame people for how they were. Yeah raised or, or brought up in business yeah and and that they people if they walk into or they inherit some things that don't perhaps serve the organization serve them serve their team maybe it worked for a while even if it didn't work it was kind of what was expected I, I think that's part of what you're talking about as well is that as things change over time we we have awakenings <laughs> in particular, mm -hmm. you can't go through the biggest global healthcare crisis of your lifetime. And then you, you have things that result like the great resignation, or as I like to call it, the not so great resignation, um, because people now have higher standards, you know, and, and they don't necessarily see why, well, wait a minute, if I had to go and work from home and, and I managed to do that for two years, and now you, you're saying everybody has to come back to the office five days a week. Well, I don't get it when it works, you know, I, so, so there has to be a little bit of, um, of give and take. So that's where, you know, an example of the indigestible organization. Wow. If it works for you, I work from home. If it works for you, now all of a sudden I don't work from home. How can we make it work for us? Um, and if people think, oh, well, that's just sort of too too nebulous to put my wrap my arms around, I, I, I want to invite your listeners to think about this. Have you ever walked into an environment? It could be a supplier. It could be a coffee shop. It could be a, a retail environment where you just feel like, I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. And other people don't want to be here. Maybe the customers don't want to be here. Maybe the staff don't want to be here. You speak with somebody who's supposedly a leader and they don't want to be here. I walk into those environments and I know it's indigestible. I know if I walked to their, if I went and looked at their glass door scores, their Google reviews, I can guess what I would see. Yeah. Similarly, I, I, I'm sure you and I have both experienced this, Ken, where we've walked into organizations where it may not seem like, oh, I, you know, I'm walking into a fast food restaurant, I'm walking into a, a coffee shop, or I'm walking into this really high pressure environment, and everybody, it seems like they want to be there. And you even see that in shifts. I do a lot of traveling. I'm a professional speaker. I do a lot of traveling. I can see the little microcosms of digestible and indigestible. I can see in this side of the, this particular set of, of team members working together, they are clicking. They like each other. They are, they are supporting each other. They don't see each, they're not fighting. They're seeing each other as there to support each other. And then I can, in the exact same um. Uh, people wearing the same uniform in the same <laughs> the same shifts, same building. I can walk over to the other side and see something completely different. They're fighting. They won't make eye contact. They won't talk to each other. And what happens? The customers are being ignored. 
um, their, their, their small requests are being disregarded. Here's the excuse why I can't make it happen. Um, they say, no, my I, no, you can't talk to my supervisor because my supervisor isn't even around. And then they tell you what's so bad about their supervisor. So the whole indigestible organization or team or, or shift, we can't just take a pill like, uh, you know, and, and make our, you know, uh, our, our body feel a little bit better. We can't just mm -hmm. do that, you know, like, um, Alka-Seltzer kind of, there's no corporate Alka-Seltzer. You have to do the work. And the good news is the easiest thing you can do is bring a little recognition into that team, that environment. And if you know, if you look for it, you see it. That shift that's working really well, people will say, wow, thank you so much. Or you're super organized or wow, that you handled that, that person well. You could see it. The When the customers acknowledge yeah, thank you so much for good service. And they receive that compliment well. When they give compliments to people, when they say over the, the voice announcement, thank you so much for your patience. You've been wonderful to serve. That's a compliment. That just literally just threw out a compliment to all the people there. Some people, it will seep into their emotional pores and their cognitions, and then they will feel valued. As opposed mm -hmm. to you're going to have to wait and only the people who could zone board zone one and you're going to all have to back away because you're in the wrong zone. Who's going to be like, oh, thank you so much for telling me that I was doing the whole airporting all wrong. Thank you so much for the scolding over the intercom. Oh, phew. A fellow passengers, aren't you glad that we're doing this whole travel thing wrong and we pay for them to do it wrong? Oh, thank God we know. So it's, it's actually, it's, it's an intuitive thing. And if it's an intuitive thing, we all know when we need to add more recognition and don't expect that somebody's going to earn the right to be recognized first, go first. I literally mm -hmm. bring compliment cards with me, um, everywhere I go, particularly when I'm traveling, because most people treat each other very, very badly. So I look for people that I can give a compliment, right? Somebody who's been really nice, who's who's helped to make the day better for whether it be customers or their peers, you help to make each other's day better or, you know, people trust each other. You know, you can rejoice knowing that other people trust and admire mm -hmm. you. You can see things to recognize and value in people so easily. The question is, do we look for it? So I'm understanding what you're saying about recognition and I, I'm understanding now indigestible, indigestible. You know, we remain predominantly um, uh, at home uh, virtual company. I mean, we're hybrid in the sense that we have these wonderful events. We come in for planning sessions. I'm missing the serendipity um, of working in person and the immediate recognition and feedback or the opportunities for immediate recognition and feedback, as well as just the outcomes of serendipitous environments. Any thoughts on how we do that in, in a virtual environment? Because it's, it's tough. Well, anytime we see something as tough, it is tough. We look for all the evidence of why it's tough and where it's difficult. Nice. <laughs> so you're right. You're absolutely mm. right. You're absolutely right. And there's no doubt much ingenuity that has happened as a result of your team having to get mm. very nimble. So I would say, and it's both and solution focused approach is what I subscribe to uh, and what we we you know, work with our clients to help understand the power of the solution focused approach, I would say, and so yes, there's been a lot of challenges of finding ways to plan events and, and collaborate as a team and serve your clients. Absolutely. And those things, there were challenges and, and no doubt still are. And how did you demonstrate the ingenuity of your thinking? How did you, how did it unlock opportunities that never would have perhaps happened that way? Had you stuck to the bricks and mortar and the way in which you planned events? How mm -hmm. have your events changed? How have they become more dynamic? How do you empathize with the people who attend your events even more so? Because you too have had to go through the rigor of being um, ingenious thinkers to be able to still make these events happen. So, you know, looking for what's working, we call that bright spotting in the solution focused world. Mm -hmm. You know, what's, what are some of the examples where the, the most um, 
dynamic, creative, collaborative, connective experiences have happened despite not being physically together and and not you know having those normally as you say serendipitous moments and finding a, you know looking for for those little tiny perhaps even more subtle ways to recognize each other and it could be in the chat uh, in your Zoom chat or your Teams chat, it could be, um, you know, sending. I, I have a colleague, uh, um, staff member, and um, it's her first official day of full time with me. She's been a contractor. She's now officially full time. Um, I, I created this little mini video last night on Canva and I sent it to her, put, put it in her inbox and said, hooray, today's officially the day. And it's in her it's in her subject line and it's a little video. It's attached. Is it, is it as fancy as I would have had we been physically in the office and I could put balloons on her chair and a cake cupcake on her desk? No. However, it's an alternative. And mm -hmm. hopefully she felt very special. So it was just, it's a different way. But the point is, I thought about it. What could I do? I have to do something. And that's what I, I think a lot of the clients that I, when I work with them and they're, what they're asking for is, I really want to make sure that people feel valued. I really want to make mm -hmm. sure we still connect. I really want to make sure that our greatest opportunities to, to collaborate and build off of each other's greatness, we don't miss out on that opportunity simply mm -hmm. because we're remote and we're hybrid. Um, so I would say, keep doing what you're doing <laughs> because you've now had years of success yeah. of being remote. Um, and let me ask you, what are three things that you have you have learned and experienced and started to do as a team that are really quite ingenious and you're very proud of it um, where you're able to, you know, to, to deliver just as much value, if not more so to each other and to your clients, even though you're remote. So, so I, I think to that, we, we have embraced the end. Um, you know, in what we deliver in our engagements, our in our in Catalyst you know, Human Ingenuity game, it can be done in person or it can be done online. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that we do not do virtually and do not stream are our live events. And we had mm -hmm. one in Toronto for about 120 people last week. Um, the, the, the warmth of being in a room in which the applause is real and live and immediate to me is absolutely critical to um, our community members, our clients and the staff and, and our team, sorry, I don't like staff. Um, mm -hmm. I think that being in a room with um, my partner, Sonia, our, our producer, like the whole team, and again, watching this evolve live um, is second to none. Um, it just shows us that we have the right people on stage, that people are engaging with how we're thinking. So I, I think there's a, there's a real end there because that moment is recognition for all of us that we are doing something good, that we are doing something right or beneficial, not in our eyes, but in, in our community or client size. So I think to me that, you know, when we do these three, four times a year, plus other engagements in person, but I think that's amazing reinforcement that, yeah, not that people like us, but people that are, are engaged by us. And that to me is still critical, whether it's three times a year, four, 12, choose mm -hmm. a number, but I, I think it's so important. Well, and, and to reinforce that, I, definitely have way more of the events that I speak at that are in person for that very mm -hmm. reason. Some of them are hybrid. One I'm doing tomorrow is hybrid. One I, the one I did last week was only in person. I did three with a week before one was hybrid, two were in person. So, you know, you're absolutely right. You have to pick to be able to serve your, your team members, your clients, whatever the context is, you do have to make a very intentional decision, not a default, right? We're only yeah. virtual, we're only hybrid. We've got to do blended. We've got to be in person. It's what, what will deliver the most value because yeah. that's ultimately why we get up in the morning to serve our clients, to, to work with each other. Yeah. Yeah. And recognizing to your point, recognizing what, where the recognition comes from, because yes, I agree with you putting things in the chat, doing things, sending things to people's home. I think these are all wonderful things, 
But we, I look at it and I say, okay, if we're going to be virtual, we still need to be together at some point. So I think we just have to create our own equation within our own organizations as to virtual and together. And, and as I said, we are a virtual organization, but we have enough togetherness through these group settings that we get to stand there and be recognized for what we do. So I, I think to most companies, and I know it just seems like humans like to say, okay, everybody back to work now. Okay, everybody virtual now. Like you mentioned a Venn diagram and to me, that's my greatest friend in business and it always has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it's, this is the perfect opportunity be, to be having stay interviews. What makes you stay? What do you like about your colleagues, how you're working, uh, it, and you will learn things when you ask from a stay interview, what makes, what keeps you here? A lot of people will say flexibility. A lot of people, if, you know, if you're in a remote environment, like what you're referring to, um, a lot of people will say being able to get together from time to time. Uh, there's, there's a whole variety of what lights people up. And for some people physically being together is important because maybe they moved or they're not perhaps um uh you know in embedded in their community the way they they once were so um you know i i it's it seems that that now is the perfect opportunity to be even more curious than we ever yes. were before about what's working for individuals and what's working for the collective and continually, and I don't have to, you know, I'm preaching the converted here around ingenious thinking is the more we have conversations about what's working, the more we can continue to navigate towards those things. And that's really the, the root of, of how this is an opportunity rather than a barrier. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people, some people want to be in person. Some people want to be totally home and other people want to be remote. That's a problem. Actually, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily it's, this is people are expressing what they want to need. If people are complaining, they're engaged. If people are loving, you know, and so happy and they're cheerleading, they're putting, you know, the positive reviews everywhere. They'll tell everybody who, who will listen to where they work, you know, they're engaged. It's the people in the middle. They're the ones that are the flight risk. They're the ones that we need to, to make sure that we're tuning into. So asking people, what do you love? You know, what, what fires you up? Why here? Would you still pick us? Uh, it, you know, who would replace you in five years if you moved up or you moved on? Um, who, where's the talent that we're missing? Where's the opportunity that we could capitalize on? All of these questions and more, I actually have this huge list on my website, greatnessmagnify.com underneath cool stuff, because people were literally saying, but okay, I like the idea of asking people. I just don't know what to ask them. It just feels so weird. And I'm like, well, maybe it's it, anytime you start something, it feels weird. You learned how to ride a bike. You were like, oh, ready to enter a triathlon, done it. All I needed to do was get on the, on the bike. So being part of these, this, this being part of how we do things around here in this, this, the world of work will never be the way it was, you know, who's to say that it should have been bricks and mortar with this very clear hierarchy and divisions. And, you know, we, people work nine to five and they work towards a pension. You and I both saw that that was falling apart well before COVID. Mm -hmm. We just now have a label that we are sticking on top of the problem, and that is hybrid work. Well, that's the problem. Oh, by the way, if that's not the problem, let's stick a, the label on the generations. Oh, must be the millennials and those Gen Zs. No, no, no. There's no problem. Criticizing and pointing blame does not make a solution oriented and progressive. Right. It, it masks right. and it creates excuses for not moving forward and moving forward together. So that. That I think this is the opportunity, and I would hope anyone who's listening who truly sees themselves as part of the solution of bringing their ingenuity and their thinking is that any one of us can recognize anyone. Any one of us can be can be expressing what we want and need. Any one of us can be conducting stay interviews by talking with colleagues, and and if they have people they're fortunate enough to lead. To, to ask them why they stay and what would it take for to, to keep them and attract more great people. Um, never has there been more conversation about expectations than now. So, and that's mm -hmm. a good thing. 
That's a good it thing. Is. Yeah, it is. No, I, 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 Sarah, this has been a, a great conversation and um, our, our time is coming to an end. It just went by so quickly. So <laughs> we've been speaking with Sarah McVanall, Greatness Magnify, greatnessmagnify.com. Just before we leave, though, I have one last question for mm -hmm. you. What is the difference between being committed and being interested? Mm. Um, uh, you just finished reading my latest blog post. I love that you did. <laughs> uh, being committed is you put your all in. Interested is, I don't like the idea of that. So here's an example. Um, have you ever met somebody who is, let's say, a triathlete? They are, they are all in, whether it mm -hmm. is Christmas day and they celebrate Christmas and they're leaving their family early, you know, and they, or they don't eat the big turkey dinner because they have, they got to have time to work out. You're committed because no matter what day of the year, no matter what else is going on, you are going to do the training. Interested is, I don't put it on my vision board. Maybe I'm going to walk a little <laughs> bit more, maybe run. Perhaps I'm going to go on my bike in the summertime. So I maybe like the idea of exercise. Maybe even like the idea of, quote, one day entering a marathon or, or an iron, iron man, iron person race. Um, but I'm not really committed. I'm not doing the work. So and that's OK, because I've never been queen sporty. So I'm fine with not being committed to that. What I am committed to hardcore is my family. You ask anybody who knows me, they will say, I unwaveringly, I will not make a decision that is not good for the well being of my family. I'll mm -hmm. do things that they wouldn't necessarily choose, like be on the road and traveling and speaking a lot. However, I would not do that on a birthday um, at a key point. Like when my daughter just started university, I did not travel that first week. I wanted to be here. I wanted to be her rock as she transitioned mm -hmm. in one of the biggest transitions she's ever had in her life. Um, so committed is what you are all in for unwaveringly, and you will make huge sacrifices for it. Interested is where, where you may dabble around the edges. And I think it's really important from a place of self-compassion. So in other words, treating others the way you would if they were in a place of struggle or failure or judgment you know, we need to be compassionate about ourselves that you may be interested in, let's say, being 150 pounds and you're 170. If you're committed to being 150, you're going to maybe do the exercise, do the, you know, whatever it takes to be 150. It's okay to be interested in being 150. And maybe there's other things that are more important than, right. than doing all the things you need to get to that point. So it's it's a it's a it's the groundwork for self recognition, yeah. my friend. Yes, uh, Sarah McVanel, uh, greatnessmagnified.com. Thank you so much for your time and joining us on. Say hi to the future today. My pleasure. Thanks, Kim. Take care.